Greetings. In today's video, I am joined by Rob Christofferson from the podcast Our Strange Skies. Please introduce yourself. Hello, I am Rob Christofferson. I have been the host of the Our Strange Skies podcast for the last four years, and I've been a uh, UFO researcher uh, since uh, 2015. Very nice. Uh, it's good to meet you. I've seen your posts on Twitter about UFO phenomena and things like that, and I, I really liked how you focus on the, the retro UFO stuff. I wanted to sort of do an interview to share thoughts about UFO phenomena and things like that because I think that we cover a lot of the same subjects because we're interested in the, the stuff from the 60s, 70s, and high strangeness and the old school stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely one of my gripes with the UFO community today is that it seems to focus on this time period from 2004 to about 2017, and there's really only four cases. It's important, but it just seems like this past this like document of all these ufo sightings going back to 1947 and even for some you know beyond that just seems to kind of get ignored within the larger context of the discourse around ufos these days and that's always kind of been just a passion for me because i i grew up with this stuff i grew up with these cases in specifically unsolved mysteries was my first foray into paranormal and just all types of uh, weird stuff. And the one case from that show that really stuck with me was the Lonnie Zamora incident. In just that it was well known, even today, when people reference it, it, it almost seems like it's in passing. I don't see a lot of podcasts covering it. I don't see a lot of people just like solely devoted to it. And it was just like kind of odd how it was um, a well known oddity within a bunch of cases that it's really important it just kind of felt like it was getting uh, lost in the cracks but that case always kind of spoke to me just in how much physical evidence there was in that case and how genuine the witness seemed uh, even with a solo witness sighting he, he just seemed like hey I saw this thing and it changed my life and that always stuck with me and then growing up, UFOs, ghosts, the paranormal and stuff like that, it kind of just like hovered in the background for a long time. Uh, until I had uh, my own sighting in 2015, I was at work and a friend of mine, a co-worker, came down to where I was and asked me to go out on a break with him. And at first, I kind of, you know, shrugged him off. I'm like, I got a ton of work to do. I just don't have the time. And he was just persistent about it. So we go outside and we're out there for maybe like a couple of minutes. And we look up in the sky and we see this egg-shaped object. And it, it wasn't at a high elevation. It, it had to have been probably around a thousand feet, maybe less. And it was just slowly kind of floating parallel to where we were standing. And then to about the point where we were standing, it just stopped in midair and it turned 90 degrees and it moved away from us just really slowly. It was kind of like, you know, just moseying on with its day. It was just doing its thing. And um, here we were just watching it. And after that, I just started to get my hands on any case that I could. It was just like this moment for me. And, and the first books that I remember buying were Bud Hopkins Intruders and uh, his first book missing time and just diving into the abduction stuff and then getting my hands on like the, the the works of Richard Dolan and other great UFO researchers and um I started uh suggesting cases to different podcast friends that I had and that uh, were also podcasters and eventually I just decided hey I just make a podcast myself so that's pretty much how the Our Strange Guys podcast came about and we've covered quite a few cases ever since then a lot of them well known a lot of them obscure and um since then you know it's just finding these little cases that are just endlessly fascinating to me yep very much so and uh i've seen a lot of the posts you do on twitter uh going through some of the old cases and you know seeing those in the timeline is always good i don't listen to a lot of podcasts honestly i watch a lot of the Fordian documentaries and uh read a lot of books 
But yep. I know that a lot of people, that's where they get their uh, 40 and, and UFO information from, is from podcasts. So it's good to have people out there who are dedicated to the old stuff and keeping it alive. Absolutely, yeah. You said was that's one of the, the purposes of your podcast is to make sure that people don't forget the older lore. The the people I follow and the, the content that I watch certainly is, is well aware of the long history of UFO sightings going all the way back to Charles Fort and beyond. But I have seen uh, a few people who are, they want to focus on UFOs like it's a brand new thing and give it a new name, you know, like mm-hmm. the, the UAPs and things like that. You know, I think it's good to give props to those who are talking about the old stuff in uh, the new way, I guess, which is through podcasts and Twitter, you know, even if you have to make memes about it on the on the timeline and get people to be aware of a case, you know, whatever you got to do. Yeah. And the thing is, is like when you share something on social media, especially if there's images associated with it, which is the kind of things that I try to do, there's there's a lot more fascinating cases than what I post online. And a lot of what I post online is uh, from the old UFO journals like Flying Saucer Review, uh, the APRO Bulletin, Nightcaps UFO Investigator. There's like endless amounts of these cases. And it's important to know your roots and where a phenomenon comes comes from and ever since that new york times article in 2017 it it kind of felt like a reset button it's so baffling to me when i i talk to some people and and then uh, there definitely needs to be a modern discourse but uh for some to say uh essentially like well we don't want to bring up those cases in the past because it makes it look bad well you can't really do that you can't really ignore a lot of this caseload because it it defines what this phenomenon is and how amorphous it is and how it has so many different appearances and it does so many different things you know it, it combines not just you know the idea of ufos or you know wherever these things are coming from there's you know paranormal related phenomenon in the 70s there were cases of bigfoot coming out of ufos that uh a lot of people you know wrote about at that time and where these things cross is just endlessly fascinating so to like break a hunk off of that and say well let's look at this case from 2004 it's pretty interesting that's what we're going to hang our hat on it just seemed to me to be it just didn't represent the full picture of what ufos and related phenomenon is yeah, I think it's very important to understand the legacy and to not deny that legacy um, because, mm-hmm. you know, there a lot of the same things that people did in the past, they're happening again. You have to look at the patterns and understand that, that this goes all the way back to Charles Fort in 1919 with the Book of the Damned. And um, yeah. even, even he was uh, finding like older lights in the sky and unexplained oddities all the way back to 1779. He found sightings that would be considered UFOs by modern standards, and, you know, and the, the history from the different researchers, like I know you're a big fan of J. Allen Hynek, mm-hmm. going yep. all the way through all the, the fanzines and the, the saucer clubs and different ups and downs and trends in the UFO field. Yeah, I think that's an important legacy. I try to keep in mind all of it, but um, if there's anything that I neglect, it's probably the modern stuff. Although, you know, <laughs> if, if there's a local who's seen a, a UFO recently, I definitely would love to talk to them. So try to keep the modern stuff going as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, you definitely can't ignore the modern stuff that is going on. The face of uh, what UFOs and UFO research was back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even in the 80s up to the 90s is far different. A lot of researchers are kind of, you know, within groups that don't share a lot of their data. They will share, you know, an occasional case that they, you know, come across that is interesting. But beyond that, it's very you know private and today just seems very i don't know watered down in a way and it it seems exclusive in the way that it's covered to the military which while i think that's important uh to be covered that's not the only story happening here Uh, and uh, they're still out there as long as you know where to look um yeah that's another point something that i don't really People want to focus on like governmental stuff. And Mm -hmm. to me, that's not the interesting part. Not really my style and not really what gets me interested in the field. 
If you think about it, the study of UFOs only goes back a hundred years ago, because uh, 1919 with Charles Fort in the Book of the Damned, till mm -hmm. now in 2021, uh, about over a hundred years, but uh, the phenomena has been around for centuries and probably for as long as human beings have been around. So in the time span, which is, you know, relatively short, uh, we haven't really gotten much headway on understanding what's going on. You're talking about how people don't share information, and uh, I think that's been a problem for a long time is there's there's not a lot of good civilian organizing about the the UFO phenomena. You know, they had the saucer clubs back in the day and those were great, but they were disparate and separated and many of them passed on and you know left their files to the garbage. So Mm -hmm. If there would have been a, a better network of people and um, maybe less competitive mindset, maybe they could have had a more of a collective study that they could have pulled from and compared and contrast their data and all that good stuff. It makes some Library of Alexandria of uh, flying saucers, perhaps. You know, there was a lot of competition and <laughs> UFO fans have never really liked each other. No, it's very divisive in the UFO world, even, you know, going back. Uh, and, and a lot of researchers, you know, did share information between each other and a lot of them you know were friends and colleagues and stuff like that uh mm -hmm. but it, there was definitely some animosity between between certain ones qfos uh apro nicap they were kind of just singular bodies and they all kind of had uh different areas that they focused on like NICAP didn't seem to want to deal with CE3 encounters, encounters with humanoids and stuff like that, whereas APRO was just kind of open to everything. And, and yeah, that's kind of the downfall to uh, having all of your... Uh, organizations it, it's segregated in many ways other than what you published in ufo journals and magazines and such and it's through those means that a lot of cases kind of got their sea legs and you know became a little more well known but i will say i i have a lot of respect for what david marler is doing with uh, the qfos files right now and uh, the fact that he's given them all a home and they're working on, you know, digitizing them is is great. It's an invaluable resource. And to anybody interested in this topic, the QFOS website is an endless resource of documents that are still, you know, great on there, especially with these older cases. If you're interested in cases like uh, Exeter incident of 1965, the original files from the investigation that Ray Fowler did are on their website. There's uh, a lot of interesting files there, including um, one of my favorite documents is the 1973 Year of the Humanoids that was collected by, I believe, Ted Phillips, who just collected all of these stories of people who had these encounters with with these weird humanoids throughout fall 1973 there were one person claimed to encounter a, a quote-unquote electric man and and there's an interesting sketch out there if you uh, if you read through that document it looks like a little humanoid figure that's made of electricity standing in the doorway it's pretty fascinating and there's other ones in there that are uh, just endlessly fascinating and uh, going through those files it just opened up something in my brain that still leaves me you know going through all of these old journals and stuff like that to find the nitty-gritty because most of what i post online these days some of the cases are a little more well known but a lot of them are obscure and it's through looking for these obscure cases that i've you know found trends that interest me like uh cases from puerto rico are endlessly entertaining especially with the way that they were documented in the 90s you find endless encounters of people coming into contact with what kind of look like just grays but like they're they encounter them in the forest the you know, yunke forest they in, encounter them you know in their own backyards in like the rural areas so it, it's interesting to look through all these old journals find these old cases but also find these like patterns and find the the cultural context that is often missing from ufos today because in those journals you got cases from all over the place not just you know the united states but uh, cases from South America, particularly Brazil and Argentina, there were areas that were really well covered by those that wrote in those journals. Uh, a lot of European countries. Uh, Russia was, even during the Cold War, was really well documented in those journals, regardless of whether it was you know disinformation or not. There's some that believe it was, but uh, I think there were a lot of good UFO cases that did come from Russia and the USSR at that time. But uh, going through all this old stuff, it just gives you a better picture of what this phenomenon looks like, especially in different areas. 
that's a good point there. The the international perspective is also something that is present in those older reports is, you know, the whole UFOs around the world. One question I forgot to ask is, uh, where are you from? I'm from West Virginia. What state are you from? I'm from New York. I'm from the Adirondacks. So I'm from the northern parts of New York. You know, a lot of uh, woods, a lot of mountains. The Adirondacks are technically part of the Appalachian Trail. Uh, and they kind of branches off a little bit. The archivists, as you were talking about, the archivists are very important because, you know, they're doing the Lord's work, archiving the, the data and scanning it and all that good stuff. The classic researchers. I've said before that Fordians don't die, they just turn the paper. Yeah, <laughs> that's another, absolutely right. Another good, uh, I guess, database, as you were mentioning there, the year of the humanoids, would be the, the Humcat or the humanoid catalog <laughs> from David Webb. Yep. And um, I always recommend, uh, as you said, the Center for UFO Studies website, but also uh, johnkeel.com, run by Doug Skinner, who uh, has all the, the John Keel files that he posts there from time to time. So there are some good, um, you know, online databases and archives of correspondence and notes from the researchers if you're interested in that and, uh, you know, places that have big databases of sightings. I have a database on my website as well, Appalachian Oddity. Try to keep that, you know, up to date and grow that as much as I can. Michael Swords as well has a, a very interesting website that has a lot of good stuff in it. You know, he was part of the Center for UFO Studies. His website's called The Big Study, and it's uh, thebiggeststudy.blogspot.com. And he's got a lot of uh, documents and data there. It's very nice. So, uh, yeah. so the first uh, UFO book that I read officially, I guess, would be The Mothman Prophecies, and that's kind of how I got into uh, the study of Fortean phenomena. I didn't just go with the UFOs. I got into all of it at once, pretty much, from, uh, you know, the Mothman and John Keel and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, I think it's important to not uh, hold too strongly to one perspective, but I definitely do enjoy John Keel and Jacques Vallée's kinds of views on this and the more spiritual, high strangeness, folklore type views of the UFO phenomena, as well as all other parts of the Fortean field. It's important to not be too rigid in your, your thinking, you know, because that's always been a problem is ideological roadblock with, you know, UFO groups and uh, UFO investigators got to keep it open so we don't make the mistakes of the past, you know? Mm -hmm. I know that you're more into Hynek, so what's your perspective on the UFO field? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think what I admire most about J. Allen Hynek is that he kind of gave people the language with which to describe these things and which to categorize things at first, and uh, there have been folks that I have definitely added on, but I, I I respect the way that he came about his beliefs in this phenomenon in which, it, you know, it was a progression over uh, a decent period of time. There were definitely points for him that kind of made him go in different directions. The idea that, you know, in 1953, well, downplay these reports that people send in just so it's not going to cause a panic. It's a downplay of sightings from about 1953 to about 1964. Four. Uh, and then, you know, the Lonnie Zamora incident occurred and it kind of changed things just because of how public a sighting it became. But for me, I, I don't necessarily ascribe to one line of thinking anymore on, on this phenomenon because there are elements of the extraterrestrial hypothesis in, in some of these cases, uh, just given the fact that they do seem to be physical. There are definitely some elements of these cases that are some Thing beyond and don't seem to be just uh, tied to a, a physical form uh, in many ways. It's It can change, it can morph, it can take on the appearance of many different things. Uh, I think it's a confluence of all these things, but I definitely don't think that one necessarily weighs heavier than the other. I think they, they all kind of come together to form the kind of view of what this is. And and, and I mean, a lot of the modern UFO researchers and the, and the folks that are interested in stuff now, they're definitely, you know, the nuts and bolts kind of folks that they see it on radar. So it has to be, you know, 100% physical, real in this dimension. And there's always like elements that I think of where, well, why couldn't something from another dimension, you know, put itself here and somehow trick a, you know, a radar system? 
I think it's definitely possible. I think the nuts and bolts uh, side of it is definitely possible. I, th- I think the more that you leave it open, the better uh, a picture that you can get at this stuff. Uh, because I think once you start really clamping down, you can really start to go off the deep end with certain things, especially duction researchers in the 80s and 90s, especially Bud Hopkins and, and David Jacobs. When you look at their work, they get to a point where it's almost a, a, a paranoia where the aliens are lying to us and they're they're using us and and all this stuff and not to say that they may not be but i think once your thinking gets rigid you get into trouble in certain areas especially you know bud hopkins yeah i'm just i'm kind of an open book when it comes to the phenomenon mm-hmm. and that's a, a good attitude to have i would say as you mentioned before a pro which was uh arizona flying saucer club started by carol lorenzen that one as you said was open to covering uh some of the weirder stuff that mm-hmm. some groups would shy away from and so those are the, the researchers i tend to enjoy and respect the most is the ones who cover the weirdest of the weird and go with the the high strangeness and all that stuff and don't leave anything on the table just say okay let's look at all of this and mm-hmm. um the phenomena definitely is a contradiction of sorts trying to reconcile it all together is a herculean task we're always going to be like sisyphus pushing the rock up the mountain mm-hmm. so you know you have to kind of collect all the stuff archive all the things you can do and um collect the puzzle pieces and hope that later generations will be able to put them together and figure it out and i think that's uh for people who are you know specifically on the modern stuff that could be what they're missing there is that this is a multi-generational study and it's not going to be solved in our lifetime so it has to be part of a larger body of work it has to be you know cumulative that this stuff will all go together one day and maybe make sense at some later point down the road so if people think they can solve it in their lifetime that's not going to happen so you have to understand that just collecting the puzzle pieces Mm -hmm. and um you, you mentioned there the, the abductee stuff of the 90s. It's interesting the different waves that UFO research went through. You know, like that's one of the first things that I looked into when I got into UFOs is, you know, the first thing people often do is build up a timeline. So anyone studying any kind of thing, they go down and go do a timeline, like a journalistic way of researching something. And so, you know, you start with uh, Charles Fort and his books and then uh, the early uh, turn of the century. And then mm-hmm. you go to um, Kenneth Arnold and 1947 and then you know it gets more crazy in the 50s in 1952 with Flatwoods Monster and that's when you get people like Carol Lorenzen popping in and uh, Gray Barker and then in 1953 you get the word UFO and then yep. in 55 you get uh, the No Men which is like a uh, a Leonard Stringfield uh, creature that uh, also called Frogman, Kentucky yep. Goblins in '55, and just keeps going from there in the the craziest of ways. You know, we had the Mothman in the '60s, and then I think in the '70s it seems that's when it got really into the the high strangeness, dreamlike stuff with uh, Keel and the Valet. Mm-hmm. And then the '80s it seemed to die off. It seemed to be the temporary death of the UFO field in the '80s before mm-hmm. it came back in a in a new way in the '90s with the abductee stuff. And it yep. wasn't exactly the same. Then from there, you know, when I was going through the timeline, like, okay, what do we have nowadays? And it's just like the disclosure movement. And it's like, oh, that's really lame. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> people uh, pretty much begging the government to tell them the, the secrets of the phenomena as if they would have any idea. And um, I much prefer the civilian saucer seekers who had those uh, UFO clubs who understood the the way you find, find out things about the phenomena is to ask people who have seen it to interview local witnesses and things like that. To me, I wouldn't go to a government or an authority to get any information on UFOs. I think that would be kind of like asking an authority to interpret the works of Shakespeare or to tell an artist how to paint. This is more of a, a philosophical study and something that I think is up to the, the public, to the civilians to, to figure out. I'm more interested in the uh, civilian experience with the, the strange. I'd be much more interested in some anecdote about, uh, you know, like a saucer landing from some farmer down the street than I would be some secret document that came from some shadowy something or other, you know? But yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a really great breakdown of it. And yeah, it's the, the, the modern stuff is just, you know, it's really 1955 where you start to see this like explosion where there's like five or six cases in the United States, you know, with the frogmen sighting the Casablanca entities from California. There was another sighting of very strange 
looking humanoids in Georgia. This one woman was driving with her husband down to Florida on vacation and they ended up seeing they're kind of hard to describe, but they look kind of like human like, but they have these like really big bumps on them, which was very strange. And the the Kentucky goblins and and from there, it kind of just seemed like a little more acceptable to have humanoids in, in your cases from time to time. And then, you know, once you move past the late 60s into the 70s, it kind of starts to ramp up there. And it's interesting to look at other countries during the early stages of, of the UFO phenomenon, and particularly 47, because if you look at Italy, about... I want to say it was close to two months after Kenneth Arnold's sighting, they had their first humanoid sighting at, at Villa Santina in which a, a painter was out, you know, just painting a landscape. He sees these aliens, they land nearby, they get out, and he kind of waves over to them. They assume it's a threatening gesture. They hit him with some, like, laser beam kind of object that paralyzes him, and they steal his easel. That's, you know, that's that's a bold move from some aliens right there, but uh, it's interesting to see where the threshold is for belief in aliens and uh if you look at other countries like if you look at puerto rico they i would say they embrace it you know more than we do if you look at brazil they embrace it way more than we do just given the number of strange sightings uh and, and a lot of those come from southern brazil the antonio vs boa stuff to the uh, Belo horizonte cyclops sightings and uh there's a, there's just a lot from brazil but uh yeah it's interesting to see how even now conservative america is with its sightings of humanoids versus other countries that seem to have embraced it and yep. in the 60s was the big uh contact e-wave everyone was a, a contact e and yep. uh, those are reports I, I really enjoy even though uh, a lot of them are very outlandish and maybe not to be taken too seriously but uh the contact e's are a, a mainstay in my mind i really like the contact e's and i know that some of the uh old school researchers didn't want anything to do with them didn't want to you know talk about them at all so it, you can see it slowly starts off with, okay, just the lights in the sky, then, okay, they can land. And then there can be beings that step out and then it gets more, okay, now they can uh, have a long uh, relationship with a person who saw them. And that's the, the repeated visitation and the contact E. And then up later we get abductees. If you think about it, you can go down the title. So first we had Kenneth Arnold, the coming of the saucers. And then we had George Adamski, the saucers had landed. And then mm -hmm. uh, a journey interrupted, which is the, the Betty and Barney Hill thing. And yep. then we have communion. And so it kind of goes down the list of the aliens getting slowly closer and closer. Kind of the whole uh, close encounters thing. Close encounters of the first kind where it's just the light in the sky. Second kind where it's some kind of trace evidence. Third kind is where you see the, the being. Is is there actually the, the fourth kind? I think, I think we'll go for abductions for number four. I'm not sure how, yep. how it expands beyond the, the Hynek setup. CE5 is, uh, I believe, just communication with alien beings. Um, uh, six is... I believe when a UFO or alien allegedly kills someone. And then seven is when, you know, alien human hybrids are being made. So, yeah, it just kind of gets uh, a little more convoluted and uh, reflects the research of the late 80s throughout the 90s when you get into the CE sixes and sevens and stuff. Yeah. And um, I think UFOs, because they got a lot more popular in, in the 90s and they were more mainstream, uh, mm. the things that were popular then are what people think of now. So when they think UFOs, aliens, they think about the Greys, which are a 90s thing, Whitley Strieber. Uh, yep. They think about crop circles, which are kind of a, a later thing that um, really is kind of a, its own Fordian phenomena that kind of gets swept up in the, the UFO field, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, cattle mutilations. Keel said that when he first wrote about those, that other people didn't want to listen to him and didn't think that that was a real thing, that he had just made all that up, the whole cattle mutilation. And now it's kind of a, a mainstay. Yep. Um, the probing thing, which comes from the Betty and Barney Hill thing, uh, mm -hmm. Roswell, which wasn't talked about until the 90s. And so a lot of the stuff that people are uh, big on is the stuff that was popular around then. Yeah. But uh, going back to the, the 50s and 60s, you had all of the what we call the phantom menagerie, as, as Ted Holliday would call it, with mm -hmm. the, the strange beings and no two alike, you know, and a yep. lot of humanoid and downright human aliens like uh, Orthon and Indrid Cold and Ashtar. Uh, they were mm -hmm. all very just normal looking humans, like an episode of Star Trek. They, they come down, they look like a, a regular person. Yeah. And those are very yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting to see that tapestry. And I think one of the best uh, examples of that is... Uh, 
if you go and you Google uh, Joe Nichols alien timeline, it's a great image of like uh, aliens from different sightings over from like the 1940s all the way up to the early 2000s. And you can kind of see like how varied they were up until about 1987 when Communion is released, when Intruders is released. And the idea of this alien as the gray uh, becomes like the main staple. And from the 80s up to the 90s, uh, throughout most of the 90s, the gray was there to stay. And the two main things that really, you know, captured people's attention during the 90s, really made UFOs as popular as they were during that time, was uh, the Unsolved Mysteries uh, airing of the Roswell incident. It, it was it became so popular and it put that case so far into the mainstream that it just kind of took on a life of its own. And it's because of that uh, episode that a lot of more eyewitnesses started coming forward. The abduction thing just really kind of took off uh, and, and became a thing of its own, especially when you had other researchers coming into the field to research it like John Mack. And I remember as a kid watching John Mack on Oprah Winfrey, you know, with my mom, like uh, it was weird to see experiencers on talk shows uh, in, in the late 80s, early 90s. Those two things uh, have kind of shaped the cultural identity of um, what aliens are, which is basically like the, the main symbol is a green gray alien head, which, you know, is, is kind of all over the place now. And if you see aliens generally represented in, you know, pop culture on a, an advertisement or something like that, they're generally little green men. Um, that image is firmly implanted into society as a whole, which is which is interesting, especially when uh, you consider the fact that um, the, the cover of Communion kind of spoke to a lot of uh, what would, uh, you know, become a lot of experiencers that would come out. And the interesting thing is, is that, you know, Whitley Strieber said the alien on the cover of the book, the image when you Google it, it's just it, it kind of has almost a visceral feeling to it in a way. It's it's like something that you may have seen before and it, it's firmly implanted into your head that this thing could exist. But what I always found interesting was the fact that he said that that being in particular which you know he said was a female was the only one that looked like that that he interacted with the other ones they kind of look like you know how we describe greys but instead of having you know these large black slanted eyes they just had like black holes for eyes and a black hole for a mouth and he also talked about these blue kind of like troll like beings that uh, were kind of the worker bees and stuff like that so it, it's interesting to to see how just one image kind of shaped what the abduction phenomenon ended up becoming in the late 80s and early 90s and it, it is still pretty much the same thing today look into the older accounts in the in the journals and stuff like that people are getting abducted by all sorts of weird things uh one of the weirdest cases and one of my favorite cases it's the abduction of a man named lee Parrish from 1977 this kentucky kid who was uh driving home late at night from a friend's house ends up seeing you know a ufo come over a set of trees he has this kind of bout of missing time where he notices that 35 minutes are just inexplicably gone he goes and he has you know he, he undergoes hypnotic regression and he's taken on board a ship and he is examined by what he describes as like uh, almost machines like sentient machines that could move that kind of get gave him different feelings as to how he should feel towards them. There was a giant wall like thing that was, you know, black in color that he was scared to death of. And there was another one that kind of seemed to be like the leader uh, of these machines. And then there was a uh, one that looked like a Coke machine that was red in color. And it, you know, seemed to be a little more friendly, but like once you get past 1987, it's the same people being abducted by the same things. And it's kind of interesting how, communion was kind of like a retrofit in a way yeah that's that's interesting um the, another thing to think about is the 90s were also kind of a, an era of rewriting and kind of being mm -hmm. more streamlined with the aliens uh and then now would be the same thing although i think a lot of the people who are into like uaps would not even want to imagine what is inside the craft if it is a craft so that's mm -hmm. interesting to think about it kind of like it brings it all back like it's a reset all the way back to the the days where you just wanted to hear about the lights in the sky and didn't want to uh, ask what was in 
them or listen to landing stories or crash stories. Anyway, the communion thing, think about this in a spiritual way. Communion is, you know, like the, the Catholics who do communion with the, the Holy Spirit and all that. So mm -hmm. it's interesting that that's the name of that book because there's a lot of spiritual ways you can look at the UFO phenomena uh, as like a mystical experience. If you read a lot of these sightings and encounters, they are, they read like a mystical experience. And Carl Jung pointed that out in his book, Flying Saucers in 1959. Mm -hmm. um, the case you mentioned there, he said missing time. And that's a concept coined by Bud Hopkins. Yep. Um, I didn't know that the alien on the cover of Communion was supposed to be female. That's some new information there. I didn't know that. That's kind mm -hmm. of interesting because when people think of Sasquatch, they often think of that famous image of the, the Patterson-Gimlin film with the, yep. you know, the arm held back. And that's also uh, a being that they said was female. I mean, they have like mammary glands. So mm -hmm. two of the things that we think of, people think of as male, Sasquatch and the gray aliens. People think of those as male, but the big famous imagery that they're drawing from are supposedly female. So that's interesting to note. Yeah, you know, greys, they're kind of asexual kind of beings that uh, you don't think would have like an associated gender identity. But it, it's kind of interesting when the experiencers will say, well, this one, it sounded like a man and the presence kind of felt, you know, like manly or more feminine. It's kind of interesting how that represents itself and especially in abduction cases and, and stuff like that. Yeah, the, the whole um, gender of the, the being is kind of interesting, like with uh, uh, moth man or dog man or anything that they are so certain that it's a man that's a kind of interesting uh, concept mm -hmm. there I guess it's all in the, the eyes of the witness yeah um, yeah the concept of something being alien though as you said a lot of people think of the grays I I much prefer the the phantom menagerie and I think that mm -hmm. the concept of alien is much more wide open you know right. like anything could be alien uh, especially given the right context like everyone is alien to someone and so I think the idea of the Phantom Menagerie fits more with what Alien is. It's anything yeah. in a, a specific context. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it, it definitely gets to the idea of trying to be open to something that you don't understand. If you can come to a firm conclusion about something that is so mysterious and doesn't offer up many answers, it just seems kind of disingenuous to do that. So yeah, the, the term Alien can refer to so much in this kind of context I, and again i look at you know bud hopkins and david jacobs and just their line of thinking and how uh, when you get a little too stiff and rigid it points you in this direction of uh, almost obsession and there's nothing wrong with necessarily being obsessed like i'm obsessed with this stuff but if you put too much of a pin in it it becomes kind of a toxic obsession <laughs> Mm -hmm. The concept of something being alien just means that it's strange or foreign to you. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I consider myself an alien and I've been alien to people before. Right. So, um, you know, aliens could also refer to uh, a mystical encounter or a spiritual encounter or, you know, any kind of strange thing. Uh, Carl Jung said in Flying Saucers, he said, in religious experience, man comes face to face with a psychologically overwhelming other. And so mm -hmm. that's really what we're talking about here when we talk about something that's alien or you use the word humanoid. Um, mm -hmm. In the contactee field, they would more personify the alien and be more, you know, like accepting to the point where they're they're calling them people. They're like, these are right. people from the planet Venus. You know, they, they attribute them full personhood, which I, I kind of like that. So. Mm -hmm. It's all about, uh, you know, humanization or what we consider human and what we consider alien and that sort of thing. So it goes down into that. And uh, what you're talking about there is, you know, paranoia. There is, uh, you know, if you think about it, it's uh, there's some xenophobia. If you think about uh, from that yep. perspective, that people are afraid of the aliens or, you know, it goes the opposite way where they consider the aliens to be the ultimate savior of everything. And that can go too far as well. So yep. you kind of got to be balanced and understand that it's more, I guess, neutral or more like humans where there are some good and some bad and don't get too paranoid, don't get too uh, devoted either. Yeah, it, it's a tough line to walk, especially if, uh, you know, you're a witness to all this. And, uh, you know, I, I've had sightings and, and strange experiences, but if you become too wrapped up in the actual experience, it can definitely send you to different areas that you don't necessarily want to be so yeah having an open mind is a, is a great thing to have when looking at this stuff
And uh, you said uh, before that people think about, uh, you know, Roswell and things like that, but you definitely got to give it up to the originators and the originals like uh, Kenneth Arnold and, you know, mm -hmm. June 24th, 1947. So, yeah. you know, that's kind of what I think about as the beginning of the UFO craze, really the, the flying saucers, um, you know, beyond just Charles Ford. It begins with Kenneth Arnold and Ray Palmer and uh, to a certain extent, Richard Schaefer even. And yeah. um, it also has its ties in the science fiction thing, the whole mm -hmm. science fiction culture, because, uh, you know, the term fan actually comes from science fiction, like early sci-fi. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. A lot of those sci-fi clubs eventually, you know, when they had the, the Schaefer mystery, then became like Schaefer mystery clubs. And then when Kenneth Arnold was published by Ray Palmer in the first issue of Fate magazine, uh, they all turned to Flying Saucer Club. And so there's definitely some overlap. Um, Gray Barker and Al Bender actually met in the letters column of a Ray Palmer science fiction publication. And, uh, you know, the whole Men in Black mythology spun out of that. And mm -hmm. they were both into the Schaefer mystery. John Keel was into the Schaefer mystery. A lot of the uh, classic researchers were very influenced by, you know, Ray Palmer, Richard Schaefer, and uh, of course, Charles Fort, because everyone's a, a Fortian. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. The early years of UFO literature and UFO research were, were interesting because, uh, you know, especially when you look at the, the folks that kind of burned out, like your Frank Scullies, who had a career turn when he published um, Behind the Flying Saucers and uh, the Aztec UFO crash in there. And that is an interesting case in and of itself because it's kind of got its own life to it, despite the fact that Scully got his information from some, you know, shady sources and put a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths and his journalistic career wasn't really the same after that but it's interesting how it's got this new life to it uh, a lot of the the early folks especially you know albert bender who this fully devoted guy to this phenomenon basically you know shuts everything down one day saying i got too close be careful out there because you know if you get too close you know things are going to happen to you and his account you know in the uh, flying saucers and the three men Talking about how, you know, Men in Black appeared in his bedroom and Men in Black encounter is that he said that the true form of the Men in Black, the the creatures that the, the, they really look like the Flatwoods monster, which is which is interesting because it just seems like, you know, you're adopting a style onto maybe an experience that you had and, and, and claiming that they flew you to the South Pole and you saw that, you know, these alien beings were using the water as a fuel source of some kind uh those early stories are, are always fascinating and just how uh they seem to be wrapped up in a level of paranoia and and there is a level of paranoia that comes with ufo research and, and a lot of these stories uh you got to keep in mind with the uh flying saucers and the three men that's kind of a, an evolved version of bender's mm -hmm. uh, original story and that one True. uh you know edited by gray barker and written in a very barker style i'll say yeah um, for sure the the one that's in they knew too much uh that one is uh, i think you know less sensational but still comes from barker um mm -hmm. you know bark is a bit of a mischief maker but the yeah. uh if you go back to uh you know the magazine or the fanzine that Bender first mentioned that he was going to quit. He pretty much just says that he's going to uh, close down his group, the International Flying Saucer Bureau from 1952. That, that's right there with Taylor Lorenzen. So it's like an early saucer club. And it's, you know, he calls it international because there's like a few people who live outside of America who are in it. And um, he announces he's going to close it down because he's been told by higher authority or from a, a higher power that he should close it down. And so that left it open for people to wonder like okay does he mean the government does he mean a higher power like god or does he mean the the ufos they're telling him to, to knock it off so mm -hmm. it kind of left it open and then uh Barker went down there to investigate and he came back with the story. So we'll never really know like what the deal is with that. But um, if you read the space review, it's full of like speculative science and sci-fi stuff. You know, it's really not what you would think of as a flying saucer publication. There's so much in there like that. And after he announced he's closing down his bureau, he does a few more issues that are just, you know, about rocket ships and all that. Yeah. And then he moved on to a different subject. So 
It could be he was just very obsessed with saucers and moved on to a different subject, though he might have had some uh, bad experience that um, caused him to, you know, not want to do it anymore. And, uh, right. you know, kind of game of telephone from there. So there could be a, a seed of truth in the Bender story, but I do think a lot of it is mythologized and, you know, covered in Barker's fingerprints. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and I mean... That's what a lot of UFOs can be, and especially in the early days, is kind of picking out the sensationalism from the actual fact, uh, especially, you know, when you get into the contactee stuff, which, uh, you know, there is a charm and a, and a wit to it, especially with your Adamskis and your Van Tassels and stuff, and even your Joe Simontons and the Eagle River incident, there's a there's a charm, certain charm to them. But uh, yeah, uh, sensationalism is always there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I like the uh, the Kazakh thing. That's mm -hmm. the the planet or the the name that Bender says to contact the three men. He says they took him to a quote bisexual planet. And yes. So... <laughs> A lot of the people who went to different planets, they always say it's like a nudist colony. So yeah. that or that, you know, they kind of mention it's just great utopia, you know, very, very rarely does someone go to another planet and be like, oh, it's, you know, about like Earth or maybe a little bit worse. It's always like the, the greatest place and they never want to leave, you know. The ones that always got me was um, reading Visitors from Landulos. And I know the uh, new edition of it has, you know, some chapters that have been cut out and, and stuff, but uh, it always kind of baffled me that uh, on Landulos, you know they live in this utopian society but for some reason there's a lot of car accidents on lanulos and there's a lot of orphan kids but those orphan kids always seem to find a home <laughs> uh, i read one where it's like they have baseball but they only play five innings yeah <laughs> just mundane stuff like that which which is great it's it's just like okay well how human like does it need to be <laughs> A lot of them have like, you know, classless, stateless societies. So you can kind of see the kind of utopia that the people who are telling the story are, are looking for, you know, like yeah. if you follow us, Earth can be like Venus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Anyway, so I was going to bring up uh, science fiction and how it kind of goes into the UFO field and kind of becomes reality. If you think about it with the H.G. Wells War of the Worlds broadcast, uh, that's kind of like an early example and something that a lot of saucer fans have pointed to as a, an early example of people believing there could be spacemen arriving at their door. So mm -hmm. um, that's an example of science fiction being taken seriously. And uh, the Schaefer mystery, you know, in the 40s is another example of that, if you think about it, because those are science fiction. They're supposedly based on true stories from Richard Schaefer, who is, you know, uh, kind of a proto contactee, if you think about it. Yeah. And, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, Richard Schaefer and uh, Ray Palmer, who was like publishing science fiction stuff, he ends up having to flee from science fiction to go more towards the paranormal and publish Fate magazine, which is like kind of the first of its kind. So mm -hmm. it's an example of science fiction becoming reality with, uh, you know, the War of the Worlds, Richard Schaefer, and then Ray Palmer and his career change there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the borders of science fiction and, and the UFO phenomenon, it's kind of interesting to see where they intersect and, and they definitely you could see the influence uh in the late 40s early 50s especially and then you have like influence from the space operas and from the films like the day the earth stood still and things like that mm -hmm. with these beings that come to warn us of nuclear annihilation and they're like perfect beings so there's uh, a lot of parallels there yeah um, my favorite science fiction ufo related book would be uh childhood's end by arthur c clark because mm -hmm. that one written in 1953 that one yep. talks about these overlords and the, the overmind that comes down uh, and makes all the children of the world psychic and then mm -hmm. you know they communicate through Ouija boards and there's like demonic looking beings and then at the end they all meld with the overmind because this giant eye in the sky so yep. that's a really uh, interesting one that um, Keel quotes in the opening pages of the Mothman Prophecies that's probably yeah. I think the most uh, UFO related sci-fi book that's kind of prophetic and interesting yeah I think my my all time favorite is a, is a book called The Way Station by Clifford Simak and uh, in that book these aliens essentially come to this Civil War soldier named Enoch Wallace and they essentially make him immortal but the, the catch is that he has to establish a way station for visiting aliens that come to Earth and it's a great short book that I definitely recommend that everyone reads. Um, another thing I was going to mention before talking about uh, the contact B culture, you know a lot of those people had a lot of cult of personality which can be a bit uh, dangerous as well as their some of their deception but um a lot of them were very kind of like proto hippies because they were like hippies mm -hmm. in the 50s and they had long hair to match like the space brothers who had long hair like uh you know orthon and all that and um 
they did channeling and a lot of the stuff that they talk about is like ripped straight from theosophy which is like yeah. you know a spiritual thing part of the, the new age i find it interesting the change up between the contactees and the abductees i've thought about that a bit wondering like what happens like what, what was it about like was it, was it just people's mindsets in the 50s or 60s that they would be more willing to go with the aliens maybe especially in the 60s and 70s people are more open to the alien that they'll you know get in their flying saucer and then you know after the 80s everyone's a little more afraid and the aliens got to take them unwillingly like what's the what's the the reason for the sudden change from follow us into the saucer to we're gonna pick you up and, and put you in there yeah it's interesting because uh you know if you look especially you know the cinema and science fiction of the 50s in particular it definitely has a more grim bent on you know uh, the destructive purposes of aliens that they could you know just come down wipe us out and, and stuff like that and and you have this juxtaposition of people having encounters with peaceful aliens that are like Venusians or from mars or something like that and they want peaceful things and they are concerned about the planet and that's been kind of like uh, one of the more interesting through lines of all of these alien contact stories from the contactees to the abductees is that there is this genuine concern for the planet even from Adamski and, and, and such all the way up to like the aerial school landing there is this element of hey you're messing up your planet you might want to take care of that before it becomes uninhabitable uh, you're going to wipe yourself out. And it's this repeat message. And even when you read it, it, it always seems to kind of play just like a minor part and get lost in the shuffle in a way. But uh, that message has always been there. And uh, I, I, I've, I've always kind of just found that interesting. It's like, hey, you're going through this terrifying experience aboard a UFO. Maybe you should take care of your planet a little more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is like uh, religious experiences in that way. A, mm -hmm. a way of getting a narrative across that you've gotten from someone else or something else kind of like uh marian apparitions in a way they come down with like a message it's typically one uh, as described there it's interesting that when people encounter a mystical other often they consider them to be more intelligent and simultaneously more moral which is uh something that doesn't always have to go coincide but you know be it religious experiences or alien experiences people assume the being to be more intelligent and have better morals than they do yeah and, yeah every single time <laughs> and uh i wondered about the abductee contactee thing uh like if aliens ever want to talk to me I'll, I'll go willingly into the craft they don't gotta abduct me but maybe it's like you know like time's running out like okay you know you guys were, were cool with us in the 70s but okay now it's the 90s come with us now you can't uh you can't drag your feet any longer we gotta you know make this happen and save your planet or or do whatever you know we have to do so maybe it's just like a timeline thing but i do think i wonder if it could be a uh human perspective thing like the human mind uh, the culture change and the zeitgeist change from the 70s to the 90s you know maybe the the peaceful hippies of the 60s and 70s were were willing to hang out with the space brothers but then in like a post reagan era more conservative perhaps the the aliens are suddenly uh you know too frightening so mm, i think what's interesting is that in you know you get to the aerial school landing in 1994 and it almost feels like the aliens kind of last stand because it's like you, you don't hear that message of the, the planet you're frying the planet do something about it it, it almost seemed to be like this last stand it, it, especially when you you hear some of the witnesses talk about how like you know the, the the thoughts that they got from these beings in in zimbabwe you know were like sad and and concerned and and, and things like that and then like ever since that encounter, it's been kind of the face of it changed. If you look at a lot of the the bigger cases that were taking up the limelight in a way, you know, you go from that case in 1994 and the next like very prominent case is the Phoenix Lights case, which is in, in many ways reminiscent of something like the Lubbock Lights or the uh, 
Hudson Valley wave, you know, just a boomerang, a large boomerang shaped object being seen. And, and from there, the cases that take up a lot of the breadth of this uh, this area of research from 1997 all the way up to now are kind of more mundane, more benign. Like uh, you look at the Southern Illinois stuff in the year 2000, the it was a triangular shaped object that was seen by a bunch of people, you know, the, the Tinley park, you know, object, the Stephenville lights, the O'Hare incident. These are all just craft being cited. And it's kind of interesting that it's just like, okay, we've done this from the forties the all over the world to 1994. Boop, we're done. Or at least it, it, that's the way it seems. And uh, the way that a lot of these cases are covered almost seems to have like an end point. <laughs> Well, well, there are so many different uh, sightings and stories the, with so many different narratives and perspectives. So there's really not any one cohesive story. As I mentioned before, it's kind of a contradiction we're trying to reconcile. But mm -hmm. uh, you can definitely note some zeitgeist changes in the, the types of story as you go through the timeline. Yeah, yeah, for sure. One thing I wanted to, to bring up that I remember from your podcast, I wanted you to, to cover this here if you could, is uh, the concept of alien feet, because you had a theory about how witnesses can't remember the feet of the humanoid or being that they encounter. And uh, I found that to be true in some of the uh, the cases. They remember everything but the feet. And when they draw mm -hmm. the feet, they obscure them behind grass or they don't draw them at all. And um, funny enough, uh, remembering back to some of my most memorable nightmares and dreams as a kid, uh, the beings in my dreams, I couldn't remember what their feet looked like if I was to draw them. So I think that's a, a strange thing there. It's interesting because like, yeah, in a lot of UFO accounts, and there is uh, one particular account of this guy named David Stevens, who had gone through an alien abduction in 1975, about two weeks before the, tra the famed Travis Walton incident. And when they were regressing him and the researchers were asking him, what did the feet look like? He kind of almost refused to answer for a little bit before he kind of said it almost looks cloven in a way it kind of looked like uh, a, a camel's and it, if you look at the alien being in that drawing it, it's very strange to begin with it has this mushroom shaped head it's got these large eyes and it doesn't have a nose or a mouth uh, looking at other accounts of alien abductions when asked to draw the feet the witness will either avoid the question or the feet will just like vary so incredibly i've seen them drawn as horse hooves i've seen them you know look like normal kind of like human feet but the the feet from being to being seem to kind of vary uh unless they're just like completely covered and that was always kind of interesting to me because it's like are you not wanting to talk about the feet because either they don't want you to talk about the feet or it's literally the last thing you would ever look at when you look at a, a person like if you you know generally you're not always going to be looking down at the feet but it's just like why is this one particular aspect so why are people so dodgy about it uh, it's been a while since i've really found any uh accounts of uh you know people refusing to describe the feet but it's just it's always something kind of in the back of my head of uh well why why do their feet look so different and I was, I was talking to one researcher, I can't remember who it was, they kind of put it in the context of, well, if it's not from here, you know, maybe it's disguising, you know, what its feet could look like, because, you know, it, it, it wants to separate itself from everybody else, or, you know, to emphasize, you know, symbolically that this is other, this is not from around here, so here's the, the feet, they're very different. Even, you know, in the in the crash retrieval, you know, literature, they'll describe the heads, they'll describe the hands, which are often webbed, nothing about the feet. So I don't know. What is it about feet that uh, just don't get talked about? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, if you look at uh, Roger Scarberry's drawing of the Mothman, he draws grass like right over where the feet would be. He draws yeah. the, the whole rest of the creature, but he doesn't draw the feet. So right. maybe just standing in the tall grass and you couldn't see it. Right. But um, I haven't seen any witnesses satisfactorily describe Mothman's feet. So yeah. in the statue, they gave him like uh, clawed like 
bird-like feet, but there's right. no way of knowing what his feet would look like. So that's a, an interesting thing there. And uh, like I said, I was remembering back to uh, one of the uh, most memorable nightmares that stuck with me from my childhood, where I was being chased by this monster through the kitchen. And uh, I remember when I tried to draw it later, like years later, I tried to draw it and I couldn't remember what the, the feet of it looked like because it was like, uh, had like dragon parts and goat parts and it was, you know, devilish, but I couldn't remember what the feet looked like. So I'm like, were, were they hooves? Were they like human feet? Were they, were their shoes? What did it look like? So I think that's an interesting thing but you know when you're dealing with something that's uh, alien or monstrous i guess it is it makes sense that they would focus on everything else but that they would be looking like right in the face or something like that um there's this idea with mothman encounters of the uh weapon focus because people say that the red eyes are so hypnotic and draw your attention to them that it obscures the other details and i was watching a a, a mothman tv spot that mentions the concept of weapon focus, which is the flaw in the testimony of witnesses with like actual like criminal stuff. If someone mm -hmm. points a gun at you, you're going to focus on the gun because your life is a danger. So you're going to focus right there on the weapon and you'll forget other details like what color shirt they had on, like what color hair they had. You'll forget other details because you're so focused on the weapon. And so there's this idea of weapon focus with Mothman's eyes. that People would focus on the eyes so much that they would lose the other details. So perhaps it could be that, that people are focusing so much on the being they don't look down and see its feet. Yeah. There's also yeah. Uh, the seraphim, which are like the classic angels. They use their wings to cover pretty much their whole body, but they cover their feet as well with their wings. Yeah, it's just it's just interesting. It's something that I, I, I literally had to walk away from because it was like bugging the heck out of me. Um, yeah, it was a very odd detail. It's one I couldn't forget. Like as soon as you said that in your, your podcast and started talking about that, it was in my mind and now, and now I'm like looking for it. So it's it's interesting. Odd detail. Yeah. Very, very specific. Yeah. And, and um, forget who it might have been talking to Rich Adam or maybe John Tenney. But the idea that this thing may be from somewhere else. So what if, you know, the obscuring of the feet or the lack of detail about the feet is definitely an emphasis on you know the otherworldly that's one theory that uh i've heard that uh, that, it, that is kind of interesting but yeah alien feet man i just it will baffle me for the rest of my life <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's an interesting pattern you found there maybe that's what you'll be remembered for like oh that that ufo feet guy yeah <laughs> I can't wait. I, I'll have that uh, written on my tombstone, I think. <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's like a meme, like where it gets stuck in your head and then you're, you're going to think about it. You're going to like look at it. Next time you look at a case, you're going to say, oh, there it is again. So yep. <laughs> one of those mind viruses you've unleashed upon the world. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, anyway, I was going to mention, um, did you know that uh, Jalen Hynek was the guy who coined the term high strangeness? Because I was kind of surprised yeah. when I found that out. Because you know, yeah, It was something they mentioned in, uh, I believe, the UFO experience is where he first wrote about it. Even there, it's kind of got like a looser definition. But from there, I, high strangeness, you know, became this. The high strangeness itself is like this like tour de force almost, uh, especially in, in certain cases and just the oddities and like the extreme oddities that end up presenting themselves and like uh, the weird details that somehow end up emerging in these cases that are just beyond the average UFO sighting, which uh, I, I appreciate those cases. And, and one thing I've come to value while looking into this stuff is, is like the very odd details that stick out or the very mundane details that you think shouldn't be noted, but are somehow significant and seem to be getting, you know, swept under the rug. That's that's what I think about most when I think about high strangeness. Mm -hmm. The original definition was basically something that's more dreamlike, you know, sort of like yeah. uh, like a dream doesn't really make much sense. And yeah. I think the, the case he used for it was the, the case where the, the woman encounters an alien who talks to her about Jesus, uh, one, yeah. one of the Bettys. Betty Andreessen, yeah. It's interesting because, uh, you know, John Keel kind of made high strangeness his bread and butter, and he didn't really uh, much care for Hynek. So it's kind of interesting how high strangeness is a, a term that he coined. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there have definitely been, you know, researchers that likely didn't care for what Keel brought to the table, especially after he published Operation Trojan Horse and the, and the things that uh, he brought to the table UFO wise. I w was recently reading through Leonard Stringfield's uh, crash retrieval status updates reports. And, you know, Leonard Stringfield was the go to guy for bringing your crash retrieval stories to from the late 70s to the mid 90s. When 
when he died. He talks about how John Keel's theory on Roswell was that it was a Japanese war balloon that had somehow, you know, managed to stay afloat for two years and just finally exploded over Corona. <laughs> he he railed against it for for quite a while, but uh, yeah, there there's de- I think you know with Keel, there's definitely this animosity with a lot of people that he had and, and that a lot of people had for him, which is which is always interesting. I always love that, especially when you think that you know J. Allen Hynek was good friends with Jacques Vallée and how Jacques Vallée was you know kind of in line with the uh, beliefs of uh, John Keel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't really uh, buy into that uh, Roswell thing. It's kind of a out there theory. But yeah. <laughs> if you think about it, it trying to reconcile, uh, you know, like a crash in his worldview, which is very spiritual, high strangeness to yeah. say, OK, well, this must have some other explanation. This can't be part of the phenomenon. So it has to be maybe something like ordinary and explainable. The whole yeah. idea of, you know, crashes and physical evidence is something that you have to try to reconcile and understand if you come from a more spiritual perspective, you know? Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. I think the high strangeness to me, like if there is any truth to the phenomena, I think it's most visible there. I think that if we're, you know, if we're going to solve it, maybe it's right there where the uh, the curtain in the we can buy some of the, the mechanisms of the phenomena. Because, you know, this whole overlap of sightings and this dreamlike stuff that clearly seems to come from the mind. It seems like when you look at high strangeness cases and cases that are really weird, you're looking at the extremities of the phenomena and then you can kind of see how it works and how... You you know, the, the strangest of things are added and how, how it comes about. I think that that seems to be, if you want to really look at it at the extremes, I think that's where to look at it from, then maybe the more uh, cohesive parts of it where the narrative all lines up and it all makes sense and it seems like something that could be flesh and blood in reality. If you look at it more in the parts where it seems to fall apart, where it seems to, you know, not make sense with reality, maybe that's the part where you can understand how this is all happening. So high strangeness is definitely something I'm big into. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one of the things that I struggle with the most when it comes to, um, you know, this idea of the physical and the not physical is the the abduction reports that definitely seem like there is some kind of physical component on it, whether it's, you know, someone who has literally gone missing for a certain period of time or whether it's, you know, scoop marks on the body. But yet there is this other kind of experience that is very dreamlike, that is very still clinical in many ways in which you know there's operating tables and there's instruments then there is a doctor's office like feel to it and yet it doesn't seem to be happening in a totally physical state so i love playing in that space for a while and just being like no it's got to be this but then it's like no because there's this aspect to it and there's this aspect to it and and there are definitely cases that you could point to and look at and say well this isn't in the keel line of ultra terrestrials and this uh, more metaphysical experience like versus your Betty Andreessen's versus your Pascagoula abductions versus your communion type stories which are very much uh, in a dreamlike state and, and and even in your average mundane sightings when people talk about how like hey all sound fell away it felt like I was in a vacuum well are are these occurring in altered states of consciousness or are these objects somehow suppressing everything uh, around it? It's fascinating to think about and it's kind of what keeps me going when it comes to looking at these cases and, and picking through details and trying to make sense of something that you can't really make sense about. Uh, there was a comparison I made the other day online where I said, this phenomenon is kind of like a person who is fascinated with puzzles, but has a roommate who switches out puzzle pieces with puzzle pieces from a different set. They don't seem to fit. They don't even look right. But it's that idea that there is something that keeps switching up the puzzle puzzle pieces that makes it compelling and makes me and a lot of people just continue to look into this stuff. And that's what I love at the end of the day. When I post stuff online, when I post, uh, you know, new episodes of the podcast, which I am working on slowly but surely, that's definitely what keeps me going at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's so much data. You really could look at the data and find, you know, whatever narrative you're looking for. And I think it's Mm -hmm. helpful to look for, like, 
like trends and patterns and parallels, but any kind of narrative you build out of the data, uh, inevitably the phenomenon will show you one that doesn't fit the narrative, that, that completely collapses your tower of cards there. Yep. So uh, just when you think you know at last, the devil pulls off his mask and laughs. So yeah. I have, uh, you know, certain ideas that I go with or consider more likely. You know, you can go ahead and poke whatever holes there are to be poked in them. But um, I think that it has to do with the mind. You know, if there was anything mm -hmm. to this phenomena, I think it has to do with the human mind, uh, the zeitgeist and, you know, culture and that sort of thing it has to somehow interface or interplay with the mind. Because I can't imagine this being something physical that doesn't somehow work with the thoughts of the recipient you know mm -hmm. i think of each sighting and each contact as kind of a message like a symbolism or imagery that is like a message if you think about like the ones that are supposed to be scary it could be like something that's innately uh, frightening or something that's a primal fear a giant bird swooping down the sky and taking you away that's something that as mammals we would be primed to be afraid of something that would be evolved to be afraid of that's part of the human mind you think about like marian apparition something that's innately comforting is uh, something motherly so if you go to like like Carl Jung and the, the archetypes and things that are present in the gray matter of, of every individual, they kind of fit with some of the narratives and storytelling and sightings that people have. But I guess you could also just say that's uh, trends and motif in storytelling because the same thing is present in fiction. But I just yeah. wonder if the phenomena is using well-established trends, well-established concepts, things that are primarily known to human beings to communicate with them and to uh, you know establish, perpetuate whatever narratives they want to therefore control mankind or communicate with mankind or something to do with, with us because it does seem to be human-centric. So I, that's kind of what I would think. You know, you think of um, some fiction like H.P. Lovecraft where the, the gods are giant and apathetic towards mankind and they don't care. Um, um, and then you think more of the religious type where they care innately about human beings and they always want the best for them. The, the UFO field seems to be more beings that perhaps are very trickstery, that want to establish narratives, that want to communicate with mankind, their overall goals unknown. But they definitely have an interest in mankind. So if there's anything too, I think it's their interest in mankind and the human mind in some way. Or it could all just be fiction and that's why it goes so well with the human mind. Um, but if I had to understand the, um, the, the mechanisms between the physical and the paraphysical or metaphysical spiritual side, I would say they have to manifest physicality. And I have no idea how that works. But I'm just like, mm -hmm. it seems like something that's not there that you can put your hand right through and then it takes form, takes shape and becomes flesh and can leave footprint. And yeah. I think that, you know, I don't know how any of that would work, but that's kind of what I imagine these beings take physical shape out of nothingness, you know, where, wherever they come from, be it the uh, something around us at all times, some energy or environment that the occultists talked about, take shape and then disappear. So that's the whole mat and demat, the materialize and dematerialize that's often talked about in the UFO field. And that would explain, you know, the footprints that lead off into nowhere and the contradiction between the physical and non-physical that they are both. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I love about this phenomenon is that it leaves itself open to these ideas. It allows you to play in that space. And then I love thinking about this stuff. Stuff. I love reading, uh, you know, new books and, and new articles that just like, hey, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about that? And it's like, yeah, you gotta gotta be open to it all. But um, like I said, you could probably poke holes in, in my uh, viewpoint there. It's just, you know, w the way I kind of reconcile it in my mind. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it's it's definitely valid, as is most thinking in this phenomenon. It's, it's fun to play in that space for a while. Uh, when it comes to like abductions or people who claim to go to another planet or, or taken somewhere else, I think that that could be just a, a trance-like state that they mm -hmm. enter into like a mystical experience. And if you yeah. were to see them, they would probably just be, you know, zoned out sitting there like with a blank expression on their face. So that's, yeah. that's kind of what I think is that maybe they, you know, wander off into the woods or, you know, are held to go somewhere, but they don't actually go to another planet. You know, kind of the way I reconcile the fact that there's no life on other planets and that they seem to be going somewhere, but there's no way they could be physically going somewhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to ask if there was any other like theories and patterns that you've noticed where you're like, this is the one that I think is when I really cracked like the case or found a pattern that people don't talk about. 
I think um, for me, and especially what I'm looking at right now, and I'm heavy into cases from Africa because it's not often that you see a lot of people talking about African UFO cases, and it's just, well, why is that? It was a question that I asked myself a couple years ago, and uh, I believe it was John Tenney. He's like, well, you kind of got to go to the, the source and find the, the research, so... In going through these cases, it's interesting to see the the cultural perspectives of other countries and, and just how they influence it. And in particular, with, with Africa, I think a, a lot of people have this idea that UFOs are experienced purely as a form of like shamanism or something like that and you know that may be true to a certain extent in certain areas but uh when you get into the the areas of southern africa you realize that the image of the ufo is something very different to the native people there in particular uh what you find over and over again are these stories of these globes of light that people experience and how they relate them to their ancestors, the spirits of their ancestors. And there are different types of spirits in particular. There was um, a spirit, I, it was known as, I believe, a rave, in which this spirit would seek out its ancestors because it did not perform their duty for them after they died. So they would take on these appearances. The one case that I, that I point to and the one case that has really endlessly fascinated me is a, a case called the La Rochelle incident of 1981. La Rochelle is this estate that was built on the border of Zimbabwe and Mozambique. I believe it was the 50s and 60s. And the folks that built it, their last name, they were the Courtaults. They were often, you know, gave money to the country and stuff like that. And eventually when they left in 1972, they bequeathed this estate to Zimbabwe. And they ended up, you know, staffing it because it kind of became this uh, tourist attraction and it had been used for many different things. But on August 15th, 1981, it was around six o'clock at night. The folks were, they were quitting for the evening. The first witness, what they saw was there were these two figures standing by a tree and they saw this giant globe of light that was just radiating light up in this tree. And then they basically saw this globe of light get down and roll into various buildings on this property. And one of the main witnesses to this was a guy named Clifford Mujena. He came out of his house. He saw this ball rolling down this building, down this uh, observation tower, and he ended up following it. He thought it was a fire of some kind, but unlike any fire he had ever seen. So he ran to the um, bell to get the uh, authorities out there. And when he did, he ran into these three people, these three beings, and they were giving off this brilliant light. He thought one of them was his boss at first, and he called out to him. These beings turned around slowly to him, and he just kind of fell on his knees because the light was just so bright. They were wearing this, like, silvery metallic kind of outfit. He couldn't really see the heads because uh, of the light. It was just so bright, and it seemed to be coming from the head area. And he basically got down, and he put his head down for a little while while until he lifted it up and they had gone but uh Cynthia Hind who was the main researcher on this case asked him what he thought it was and he basically said well I thought it was the ghosts of my ancestors and a lot of the witnesses did and when she turned around and said well wouldn't your ancestors be wearing you know like loincloths and 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 carrying spears and stuff like that his response was brilliant. He just said, well, you know, times change. So naturally they would have to change. And that cultural perspective has kind of given me insight into this phenomenon as it relates to us. And, and like I said before, with like Puerto Rico and this idea that the alien is almost indigenous to the land, and, and especially in the El Yunque rainforest or like Brazil, there is a counterpart to the sightings in Brazil where there are hostile, these different cultures cultural aspects of this phenomenon is what I've been looking at and what is just endlessly fascinating to me at the moment. So in terms of episodes that I've got coming up for the Our Strange Guys podcast, the first place that we're going to is Africa, and I'm going to be uh, doing my best to kind of present the African perspective on UFOs and um, abductions and things like that. And then we'll move to Puerto Rico and uh, some more cases from Brazil and uh, just uh, move around the world and present these cases in different uh, different lights that I think need to be presented. 
Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of different frameworks and perspectives about UFOs and, you know, goes all the way back because they're just lights in the sky. People could attribute them to anything or consider them to be whatever lines up with the perspectives they hold. And so there really is no one that's right. The whole UFO alien thing that people think of is just another framework of understanding the lights in the sky. You know, before they were like fairy lights or ghost rockets or whatever else fits to the, the lore of the land or the zeitgeist of the moment. So I definitely see all of those as kind of equal. And as I said, before the concept of what is alien and wide open mm -hmm. um there there was one thing i don't remember where it was but it was uh people were seeing lights in the sky that they were attributing to this winged being that had like a glowing chest and i forget what that was but there there is sometimes people would just see a light and that itself is confirmation of whatever is in the mind so mm -hmm. people used to see lights in the sky and attribute them to witches flying on broomsticks that had a, like a lantern at the end of it so just the light they don't see anything else but they build around what that light must be so there's definitely a lot of that i've got um an advertisement that i found that i found very interesting called the navajo club ad that was printed in the navajo times august 29th 1962 all navajos invited to join irrespective of religious belief must have some faith in the religion of the navajo and must have strange dreams or must have had visions or must have seen a quote flying saucer at least once in the past years. So that's a, a requirement for a club that was trying to be established there in Arizona. <laughs> that's interesting. That's... So I, I found that very interesting because it's like they're, they're saying you have to have some kind of vision or encounter to be a part of the club and they're incorporating flying saucer mythology into what those visions could be. We talked about UFOs mostly, but are you interested in monsters, spirits, psychic abilities, uh, you know, ESP, all that sort of thing, other parts of the Fordian subject matter? Oh, yeah. I devote most of my time to UFOs, but I've always been fascinated with uh, paranormal encounters, ghostly encounters. Uh, cryptids have always been a thing for me since I was a kid. And I grew up and still live like not that far from Lake Champlain, you know, going to Vermont on trips and remembering my mom always saying, hey, look out for Champ. Get out of the car. Go look for Champ and stuff. One area that uh, I've really come to find an interest in is folks claiming past life experiences and stuff like that when kids just come up and say oh yeah i i died there random uh statements like that that have some kind of verifiable fact behind them is uh, uh endlessly entertaining to me but yeah i've definitely always been interested in all aspects of like the weird and the strange i just kind of landed on ufos before it was ufos ghosts and ghost encounters are something that definitely uh, piqued my interest especially you know on, on unexplained segments of unsolved mysteries with the, the whole ufo thing it, it does extend beyond just uh ufos because it goes to sasquatch with the ufos and stan gordon mm -hmm. and uh Loch ness and the, and the ufos with ted holiday and stuff like that so it yep. really is you know all over 40 and phenomena those little lights in the sky so was there uh, an inciting incident that got you interested in the Fordian field? When I was about five or six years old, this was on Christmas Eve. It's about 1030 at night. I woke up. Uh, I had to go to the bathroom. Right next to my bedroom, there was the landing that led down to our front door in our apartment. On this particular night, I noticed that the door was open and that it was kind of closing rather slowly. I could tell because of the hallway light that you could see from just underneath the door. It was uh, shrinking. So I assumed that it was my uh, downstairs neighbor. So I went to the bathroom and I, and I climbed back in bed. And about two minutes after I did, there was this small shadow that appeared in my doorway. The best way that I can describe it is it looked like a lawn gnome because it had a pointy head. It was really short. I couldn't make out a lot of features, but it kind of seemed like it had the baggy clothes of a lawn gnome. And it just stood there in my doorway for a couple seconds before it walked into my bedroom, walked in front of my bed, and I don't remember anything after that. That incident kind of, it was the first of like a bunch of different things that have happened to me throughout my life that kind of has sustained my interest in this stuff. Cool. So I know you said that you, you've seen something you would consider a UFO. Have mm -hmm. you seen a, a Sasquatch or experienced any psychic phenomena or owned a haunted item or done anything like that? 
I have seen on, on a walk to work about almost 10 years ago now. And so it was like 4, 4.30 in the morning. This was an August morning, so it was kind of muggy still. I had turned down the typical street that I usually did. And as I was walking closer, I noticed that there was this animal on a lawn up ahead. Uh, I couldn't really get the best view of it. I kind of assumed it was a deer because normally around that time of year, you start to see the deer as I got closer, about 20 feet away, I noticed that this whatever this thing was, it was hunched over. And when I stopped, it stood up and it was standing on two legs. The best way I can describe it is that it had a very human looking face. Its features were relatively small, like a human being's. This creature had like scaly skin that was green in color it also had kind of like a tail it's kind of like what you would call your classic lizard type person sighting except whereas most seem very animalistic in the face this creature whatever it was was very human looking uh in the face it kind of looked back it had something in its hand that i couldn't really tell what it was but it was like round and was white in color it turned and it looked at me and it looked at me for about five seconds before it turned away from me and ran into this person's backyard that's definitely something that uh i'm still trying to wrap my mind around it all these years later what the heck it was uh what the heck it was doing there that's probably about the most extreme thing that i've ever encountered yeah very interesting uh has your interest in the, the Fordian field made you more spiritual do you incorporate uh the weirdness that goes on there into your view of uh, the spiritual or the divine or keep those things separate or more atheistic or what's your take on the whole spirituality thing I think that over time, being exposed to this stuff more and more, my spiritual views have become less dogmatic and, and more open to the possibilities of what the spirituality of this stuff could technically be. Because it just seems so wide ranging that it to limit it to just one view seems wrong in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a, a good perspective to have, the, the sort of open explorer Fordian position there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like remain searching, remain doubtful, and the moment you claim to have found truth, that's when you're really lost. So yeah. uh, as Charles Fort said, I can conceive of nothing in religion or philosophy that is more than anything to wear for a while. So mm -hmm. anything that you can think of, just something to wear for a while, something to mull over in your mind, but not something to really dedicate your, yourself to in any real substantive way or to take that leap of faith, always uh, remain hypothetical and skeptical and uh, don't uh, commit to philosophical suicide. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you had to put a number on it, how long have you been interested in the Fordian subject matter? Probably at least 30 years. I'm 38 years old now, and it's always just kind of been there. The idea of spirits being out there and, and also this element of like, hey, there are resources where you can learn more about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and likewise, I have a, a lifelong fascination with the strange and the uncanny. And I had a very uh, superstitious upbringing. But I would say my real the real moment I became like dedicated Fordian was uh, somewhere around like late 2015, early 2016 is when I fully became like, OK, I'm dedicated. I'm in this. But, you know, mm -hmm. I've always enjoyed the oddities and the uncanniness and things like that. And I've always been an alien. So <laughs> what year did you start your podcast, Our Strange Skies? It was late 2017. I was uh, actually um, New Year's Eve 2017 when I launched the first episode. Slowly but surely been churning out content here and there. So. Uh, do you have any uh, favorite fanzines or groups or researchers or books that you could go down a list of? For me, it would be like Keel, Valet, and then the classics, the Moth and Prophecies and all, all their works, like, I guess, uh, APRO and things like that. Yeah, uh, I've, uh, I've been a fan of, of Keel and, and Valet and, and Hynek. Those were the main three that I first ever really went to, aside from the Bud Hopkins works and, and Whitley Strieber. Those are kind of the first things, but the stuff that I really attached myself to were the works of Valet, because uh, I think what's great in 
his books and you kind of have to get all of them to kind of see this is this one guy who started out as like this nuts and bolts extraterrestrial kind of belief system behind this and how it evolved into the stuff in you know passport to magonia beyond into his other investigations and the progression there has been great especially in the journals that he has published with keel definitely operation trojan horse the mothman prophecies the eighth tower have been great with uh, heineck it's been great to get the insight of the government aspect of it how it was handled which which he goes into in his uh second book the heineck ufo report which is a great one one of my absolute all-time favorite books and it's a book that isn't talked about a lot it's called ufo dynamics by a guy named bertolt schwartz and uh schwartz was kind of a he was a parapsychologist he he brought a really unique perspective and uh brought really unique cases to the table and that's a book that i keep going back to because it's full of just endlessly uh entertaining stories and and cases and his thoughts on the psychiatric aspects uh, of the phenomenon is is absolutely fantastic to read about i pretty much just try to read anything and everything that i can get my hands on and especially for the historical aspects i like one of my absolute favorites is jerome clark's uh ufo encyclopedia which uh just a couple years ago the third edition was released and uh that is an invaluable resource just given the amount of time that he dedicates to the cases in there and the and the people and, and stuff it, it gives you kind of a great idea of everything that the phenomenon has to offer from just like full breakdown of cases like Travis Walton incident and a lot of other famous incidents and stuff. Um, those are the main resources that I absolutely love. The other things that I really consume are, uh, are podcasts. Yep. Very nice. Um, another book I could throw out there since uh, before you were talking about like a timeline and you mentioned Joe Nichols' timeline. Uh, a really good timeline is An Illustrated History of UFOs by Boardman. That's a yep. good one to recommend to those who want to look into the legacy of UFOs before today. So if you want to know like a quick rundown of the important figures and contactees and sightings, that's a, a pretty good one that's you know very quick and goes through the cliff notes. So I like that one to recommend to people. And yeah. uh, I mentioned uh, researchers I liked, but I think my favorite group would have to be uh, the original Fortean Society and the later INFO, which is the International Fortean Organization. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are the research societies that I try to base my organizing around when I do like research societies and collaborate with people. I try to think of it like that, where it's um, intersectional to the point where it's monsters, spirits, UFOs, psychic abilities, all of the stuff, just anything weird fully there, you know, although I do have great respect for the Flying Saucer Club, I think research societies like that are kind of what I base my uh, organizing around. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for coming on and sharing your interest in UFOs with me there, talking about the, the mysteries that we've been talking about for hundreds of years now, you know, <laughs> nowhere closer to solving them, but yeah. um, talking about the, the classic cases and talking about some new ideas, talking about everything and all things UFO. So thank you very much. And you can also check out his UFO podcast, Our Strange Skies. Absolutely. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, anything else to say before I, I do the closing? No. Nope. Uh, thank you uh, for having me on. This has been great, man. Yep. Thanks for watching. The Mountaineers are always free. Okay. And we're done. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, man. Peace. Have a good night.